year and a half ago, we worked out a formal semantics of this entire language. It's on the web. It's about 75 pages of ASCII of uh, structured operational semantics execution rules. I think one story on this, theor uh, this theme of theory and practice is we had a hard time publishing it because uh, people said when we submitted it to programming language conferences, this is awful. First of all, you had no new semantic techniques, so not good research. And second, it's JavaScript, which is a horrible language. So, you know, we don't want it. <laughs> of course, the point was, it's JavaScript, which everybody uses, and we didn't have to do anything fancy. We just followed standard methods, because standard methods are the ones that people agree, uh, you know, give reasonable results. But eventually, we found somebody to take it. No offense to anyone on the program committee. And then went on to use this, which has been, I think, uh, productive. So we proved some things about this operational semantics, but that was basically just to get confidence in uh, our formalization of uh, the way JavaScript behaves. Just for those of you not familiar with it, this operational semantics defines three functions. You know, how an expression evaluates. This is given a starting expression. If you evaluate it one step, what do you get after that? How does a statement execute? How does a program execute? And this is a, what's called a small step semantics. Each evaluation step is formalized as an operation on program states, which consist of the text of a program and a representation of the heap, the state of the, in JavaScript, the stack and heap are all on the heap. So the state of the machine. And this divides into atomic transitions what happens for an uh, ex uh, expression being evaluated, and then what happens if that occurs in a larger context of a program. So it's structured in a certain way that people working in this area have found productive, and that's all I'm going to say about uh, operational semantics. If you like, I can point you to much more information there. So now we're interested in the problem of isolating the JavaScript to prevent certain kinds of malicious behavior we went through our operational semantics and tried to understand what can happen when you execute a JavaScript program. So maybe not necessary to read all of these in, in detail, but the idea was, first of all, we're interested in access to data structures. So we want to know what are the ways that a JavaScript program can access a property of an object or piece of data. Either you have a name of it as a variable, it's a property of an object, or there's this array lookup kind of method where this second argument is evaluated and then that's indexed into the first object. So we tried to look at explicit objects, access, implicit access, ways that strings get turned into code, and ways that you can get access to these scope objects sitting on the heap because those kind of translate back and forth between accessing something as a variable name and accessing it as part of an object sitting on the heap. So one of the big challenges is this kind of two ways to access things, and we had to handle both of those. So uh, the first part of our solution is to look at how to blacklist certain kinds of names from occurring in the program. So we'll start with a list of things that are not supposed to be accessible and try to enforce that. Uh, because of this scope object issue, we have to access the variable name. We also have to prevent that being used as a property of an object. And uh, let me kind of just give you the high level points. The first kind of step in our solution, there'll be three kind of language fragments we'll talk about briefly. Uh, one is given a list of things that are not supposed to be accessible, a blacklist B, then we have to assume that programs are going to be allowed to access some implicitly accessed native objects. And as long as B doesn't conflict with a native object list, the things you're trying to prevent access to are not the things that you can't prevent access to, then we have a solution. And it involves disallowing things with that name and disallowing constructs that could produce the same effect as having a direct name for something. So something that converts strings into instructions 
which then can do arbitrary stuff, that would be a, an end around this step of, of preventing those names in a program. So we have to do those two. And then the one thing that's a little bit subtle is this array indexing mechanism. You could remove that, but our goal was to have a useful kind of subset of the JavaScript language that people wouldn't mind writing programs in, even though we'd constrain the set of things it can do. And so for that, we insert a runtime check that by pre-processing, so this is something that would happen at the Facebook site, you can change this E1 of E2 to E1 of some function applied to E2, where the function inserted checks whether the value is OK or whether it's trying to get out this set of constraints we're imposing uh, as a sandbox. And so let me say just a minute about this one. This is kind of the most JavaScript on any slide, I think. Uh, possibly that's a lie. Uh, but our technique here was to use things that begin with a dollar sign kind of as our scratch space for implementing a function that checks whether the value of the expression is something bad or not. So this says if it's, if it's on our bad list, return bad, otherwise return its value. Uh, so I think that's the main point is that we need some little scratch space, so our own local variables to implement our checking functions. And so we need to include those in this kind of blacklist of for forbidden things. The other thing is there's a subtlety here. This function first finds the value of the expression and then does some tests on it. So dollar sign is kind of an awkward variable name maybe if you're reading this for the first time. But we only evaluate this argument once and then check some properties of it. Uh, the actual Facebook implementation when they tried to follow our instruction implemented it twice. I mean evaluated E twice and that led to some problems. We could break their system by inserting some expression. The first time you evaluate it, it, it returns some innocuous value. And the second time it evalu you evaluate it, it returns something dangerous. And so that's an example of the kind of mistake that led to successful attacks on Facebook. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with the approach they were following. It's just that there are lots and lots of details and a kind of systematic way of formulating how things work and going through trying to prove that the method is correct gave us an opportunity to find uh, many of their little mistakes. So this gives us a good subset of JavaScript that doesn't access uh, prohibited uh, parts of a page. Uh, it's, it has some limitations but it does uh, solve that uh, direct problem. Uh, in order to really get the kind of isolation we want for Facebook, because of this uh, dif difference between variable, this interchangeability of variable names and properties or, or portions of objects, we also need to prevent access to these activation record scope objects that are on the heap. And so that leads to the second sort of set of, of issues is we need to make sure this special thing, this, doesn't return a pointer to the global object, the global environment, or a local ob object, the local environment. And we have kind of two ways of doing that. So they both are similar. And to give you the first one, what we want to do is uh, add to use our blacklisting mechanism and add some runtime tests to places where the variable this uh, is used to make sure that if it points to the global object, meaning the object whose properties are the global variables, then we don't return any useful pointer, otherwise return the pointer value that it had originally. So we we'll runtime checking to make sure that this particular construct in JavaScript doesn't return something dangerous. And then we also have to prevent access to what look like pretty innocuous functions. Sorting, concatenating, reversing this arrays. And the reason has to do with some kind of funny idea that I don't really understand. That these things in call, when called in certain ways on the global, uh, you know, without a particular argument that you'd normally use, return the global scope, sort of as the default value. 
So first, 